And good evening and welcome to Lift FM 98.5 and 97.9 on your FM radio dial. And of course, we are available on the World Wide Web at liftfm.com. And also, all of our programs are always available. We keep them all archived at advantageradioministries.org. Once again, advantageradioministries.org. Click on Second Chances and then you can select any one of our shows that we've had. Uh, since we began this program, actually, several years ago. And just so many wonderful testimonies, so many wonderful experiences that the Lord has always been in the center of. We have some wonderful guests that uh, have uh, been set free, some wonderful guests that have just done all kinds of neat and exciting things have happened in their lives. Some people have uh, written books. And speaking of writing books, we actually have, I think this may be the first time I've ever had a husband and wife combination where they they actually uh wrote a book together is that uh, correct yes yes, yes. okay uh-huh. and we have with us on the phone tonight we have dick and debbie church and uh they they wrote a book entitled don't ever look down uh surviving cancer together and we're going to talk more about that book uh, in a little bit but uh, we'd first of all like to to thank both of you for joining us here on second chances tonight well, thank, thank you. you. We're, we look forward to it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, let's start off with uh, Debbie. Uh, Debbie, why don't you give me a little bit of uh, background of, uh, you know, where you're from? Did you come from a Christian home and, and things like that? Yes, I did. I, I lived in um, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and my parents owned a small office supply there, and and I was a became a Christian early in my life when I was about 12 at a GA camp, and I accepted the Lord there, but uh, and it it really has guided me through my life. I didn't really have a, a terrible youth or teenage uh, waywardness because I had accepted the Lord and came from a Christian home when I was 12, and so that really helped me as I grew grew up. Uh, Dick, uh, did you come from a Christian home? Uh, were your family Christian? What was your story? Yes, um, my dad was a police officer in a small town. Uh, I guess you could say I was a redneck, and my mother worked in a hosiery mill. And uh, I, we we didn't go when I was real young. We didn't go to church that often. When we went, we went to a Methodist church. But uh, both my parents uh, they did accept Christ. Uh, in fact, it was later in life when they did that. Uh, good, good home. My daddy, a uh, great father. My mother was a wonderful mother. Have two older sisters. Uh, it's like I have really three mothers with two older sisters. And so I was 11 years old. Uh, I was going to Young Street Baptist Church in Concord, North Carolina, and I was sitting beside my grandmother, and uh, she was the one that had the big purse that was filled with candy. And sometimes I think that's the only reason I was sitting beside Granny was to get candy. But anyway, Reverend Floyd Willis was preaching on a Sunday night, and I just became convicted, uh, as you could imagine. And I remember holding on to the pews until, like, the last verse of Just As I Am was sung. And I just felt the need. I had to go forward, as you know, many Baptist churches, you go forward. And uh, took the pastor's hand and said, uh, Pastor Willis, I need Jesus in my life. So at that point, we knelt at the altar. And I asked Christ into my heart. And since then, have been perfect. But uh, my life was changed, and uh, uh, Christ has been with me. For, for my entire life, and the blessings have been tremendous. Now, Dick, uh, as we all know, uh, as we walk our, the Christian walk, there's times that uh, uh, obviously were stronger than others. Was there ever a time, Dick, in, in your walk with the Lord where, you know, you really uh, lost your way or, or uh, had, a, had a real difficult struggle uh, early on in your Christianity? Oh, uh, thank, thank you so much for asking that. That's a, that is a great question. It, it's as if you already... Uh, knew that before you asked me, because I've had some very, very, very uh, interesting struggles. Uh, I was called into the ministry when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, attending church, I had all the confirmation I felt that uh, that was good as I studied and talked with people. You know, I was preaching a lot, teaching a lot. I had a lot of confirmation from uh, some brothers and sisters in Christ. I enjoyed what I was doing, prayed about it. And I felt like that uh, God was calling me to the ministry. And at that moment, I was at East Carolina University in the art school. I've always been able to draw and that sort of thing. So I thought my 
my career was going to be as a commercial artist. And so I remember praying real hard on the practice football field, East Carolina University, saying, God help me, God, show me the direction. And he did that night. I really believe that. And I, it, then I attended, I dropped out of the uh, art school and attended the University of North Carolina in Charlotte because uh, I was from Concord and it was close to my, to my home. And I majored in religion, uh, just basic secular religious studies. I felt like that would be beneficial to me, you know, as I would pursue the ministry, as I got into the ministry. And I was incredibly, significantly challenged. Uh, most of my professors were very radical. Most of them were not Christian. Uh, most of them were um, just almost agnostics and atheists. And I was terribly challenged. Uh, I got very, very confused because you want to please the professor. You want to do good in school. So I, was, uh, I became very perplexed because what they were teaching me in the religion classes wasn't what Grandma taught me growing up. It wasn't what I was learning in a typical Baptist church. So I remember um, when I got through with the University of North Carolina major religion, I attended Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary back in the, uh, back in the 70s. And at that time, uh, many of the seminaries were leaning a little bit liberal, more left-wing, of course, than they are now. And I remember thinking, I can't wait until I get to seminary so I can be, you know, firmed up in my faith. Well, when I got to the seminary during those days, uh, I became even more challenged because most of the professors there uh, were, were very liberal, uh, moderate to liberal. And the best thing about seminary, by the way, is where I'm, that's where I'm at in life, Danny. But anyway, uh, when I graduated from uh, seminary with a Master of Divinity, it still took me a couple years to kind of get my head screwed on right again. I got involved with uh, very conservative people, some dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I got involved in a very, very uh, Bible-believing, God-loving church down in Florida. And it took me a while, but I, I kind of got my head right. The Holy Spirit worked with me, never let me go. And looking back, I don't regret having what I've gone, having gone through that, because I really believe that, uh, that it did make me stronger, and it helps me better understand what other folks are thinking, specifically uh, in this particular culture we're living in. Uh, Dick, before I ask uh, Debbie the same question, uh, obvious question, are you uh, in the ministry today? Yes, yes, I've been in the ministry for 25 years. I work for a, a very large, one of the largest uh, national missions organization in, in North America. We, uh, we assist missionaries, pastors, churches, uh, church planners, uh, we uh, we develop resources, materials, do a lot of consulting, do seminars, and it's just a great, great place to work, and God has really uh, blessed me by having the opportunity to work there. Uh, interesting question that comes to mind. Uh, you mentioned you had some conflict with uh, what the professors were teaching uh, based on your beliefs and uh, their lack of uh, knowledge and, and beliefs. Uh, what would you recommend to a, a, a person that's young that uh, may be hearing this interview and they're faced with a, sem a similar dilemma? Uh, what would you want to say to them to uh, maybe get them uh, through their situation of uh, conflict such as what you had? Oh, great. Um, I remember after I was uh, in the ministry, uh, years after I had uh, you know, left seminary, working at a great church, a very great church, uh, conservative church in Florida, we had Josh McDowell to come and do a youth uh, emphasis for us. And I remember, I don't know, you know if it, uh, he wrote several great books, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which really uh, combated uh, liberalism, liberal theology, and really gave a reasonable, scholarly approach to say, hey, you know, conservative folks aren't stupid. You know, we're pretty smart, so we can, uh, you know, we can, you know, hoe our own way. And so, uh, so what, what I would recommend is, and I, I forgot to say, I went up to Josh and I said, uh, Josh, I just want you to know, I wish I would have had your book when I was in seminary. But what I would say to a young person, before you go to, let's say, a Bible college or a seminary, make sure you investigate it, because there's some great schools out there, but there's some schools that are really, really confusing. So check on the school, talk to folks that have have uh, graduated from the school or are going to the school, talk to the administration, find out what they believe, how they believe, what their, uh, what their theology is, that sort of thing. And also, as you would imagine, to really pray hard and say, God, give me direction, give me leadership in the, the area, the school, the position that you want me to go. And always, always 
put your nose into the Bible. A lot of folks can say a lot of things, but let God be your God. Let the Holy Spirit, he's the one that guides us in the truth. So never forsake this time alone with God instead of time alone with the professor, so to speak. So stay in the Word, trust God, um, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll help you through the difficult struggles if you maintain your focus on Him and, um, and, and not get so caught up and so, I guess, trusting of whatever a professor says. Find out your own. Search your own. Uh, study your own. And uh, God will give you the wisdom that you need to make the decisions you need to make. Mm. Next question for Debbie. Uh, Debbie, was there ever a time in your walk, uh, we, we talked about it with uh, Dick, your husband, but was there ever a time in your walk where you kind of lost uh, lost your way with the Lord? Um, I can't say that there was really ever a time that I lost my way with the Lord. Um, I did go to seminary also, and I got my Master of Divinity, but... I really wanted to go into counseling, and I wanted to go into biblical counseling, and so that's why I went to seminary also. And the major reason Dick and I picked the seminary that we went to was because it was close to our home, uh, and we wanted to be close to our families. And we didn't know uh, what they stood for doctrinally, and so we, uh, we both went. I, I would say there we got a little confused, both of us did, but but basically I I uh, I didn't so much as uh, Dick try uh, wandered a little bit more than I did, and when we went to Florida, we got into a real uh, great church. Um, uh, on my direction, we met some friends. I met a girlfriend, and we went to that church and. And that's what really turned us around and, and back into the Word like we both knew we should be. But I would say that was a little bit of a dry spot in my walk, too. Uh, how did you two meet, uh, Debbie? Well, we met at a seminary, and uh, the first time Dick saw me on campus, I was in, on crutches, and I had uh, broken my foot, and uh, he... Uh, he had seen me in a little directory uh, before he ever saw me on campus, and he said he even remembers God saying, oh, that's the girl you're going to marry. And um, and then he went, yeah, right, I, I don't think that that's true. But he saw me on campus about a year later, and I had crutches, and we, uh, we started um, in some similar classes together. And uh, as you can imagine, there are not many women at seminary, but I was one of the few, and uh, that's how we started going out to lunch together with a bunch of friends, and that's how we met. And then he became my Greek grader. He he graded me in Greek, and <laughs> so I needed, uh, you know, I needed a good grade, so I started, uh, you know, dating the guy that gave me my Great. I mean, that was reasonable, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I did. You know, I, I wasn't dumb. So, um, but anyway, that's how we met at, at seminary. Now, yeah, let me say that was very interesting when I was looking at the student directory. And at that time, I was not dating anybody. I was too involved in out, out and about and hiking and climbing mountains and that sort of thing. I was a real outdoors person. And I really wasn't very interested in finding a wife or finding a girlfriend, for that matter. But I was pilfering through, just kind of sifting through the student directory, all the new students that uh, were attending Southeastern. And I remember looking at the girls saying, hey, man, that's a, that's a good look. Oh, no, not that one. No, not that one. And anyway, so when I came to Debbie's picture, this is no joke. In my heart, in my mind, it was like, it was like it said, this is the girls you're going to marry. And as Debbie said, I laughed. I thought, well, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> and sure enough, one thing led to another. And here we are, 31 years later, you know, or so, well, 31 years married, I should say. Uh, very, very happy and thankful that I was looking through that directory and I saw that beautiful, beautiful girl named Debbie Knight from Fayetteville, North Carolina. She totally changed, radically changed my life forever. Mm. <laughs> Now, now, Debbie, you mentioned you went to <clears throat> seminary. Uh, the The goal was to be some kind of a, a, a Bible counselor. Is that correct? Is that what you said? Right, well, right. Like a pastoral counselor, and can't and you know, in counseling with. I really wanted to counsel with women and uh, uh, 
you know, their their issues and through the church and and really uh, minister to them, and uh, that that was my interest. Now, uh, the the obvious question. This is one of the few things we talked about uh, before we began the interview because I really don't know a lot about uh, you or Dick, but. One of the things you told me was, well, Greg, I became an oncology counselor uh, prior to my my, uh, battle with cancer. How did that happen? Well, I've always been a frustrated doctor. I loved medicine, and and, uh, one day uh, there was an opportunity. A friend directed me to uh, some oncology program that a hospital had down in Florida, and... uh, that's how it became. I became involved. I had done some work at a hospital in North Carolina and worked on the oncology for for some. And but then full time, I uh, became the oncology counselor at Morton Plan Hospital in Clearwater, Florida. And that's how that's how that happened. And I just loved it. I loved uh, helping people with medical problems. I came uh, involved with the staff doctors and the nurses. I actually worked on the oncology floor, and I would round with the doctors. And so I would started um, learning about the different cancers and helping the families and the uh, different patients that I would become involved with. And most of the time it was because the doctors would um, order you know, place an order and ask me to go see this family, because as you can imagine, when you're diagnosed with cancer, uh, it, it's a family disease, and it affects everyone that you're around. So that's what I started, and that's how I started uh, becoming a oncology counselor. And so now I've done it for almost 18 years. Mm. How long prior to your situation, your diagnos- uh, diagnosis with cancer, were you a uh, oncology counselor? How long prior to that? Oh, probably about 16 years. So wow. uh, I'm still working in oncology now, and I uh, work at a hospital here in the Atlanta area. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us, uh, you and Dick, uh, maybe together, I know the book uh, deals with uh, your perspective, his perspective of um, surviving cancer together. Of course, the book is entitled "Don't Ever Look Down." Tell okay. us uh, about that moment uh, when when you found out uh, that you had cancer, and and what went on in your life and in Dick's life at that time. Tell us a little bit about that uh, part of your life. Okay, um, my my problem always was I I found the cancer myself, um, having been in oncology for so many years. I, I knew what to look for, and I did find the cancer. And But what I did was not really great. I kind of kept it secret for about a month because Thanksgiving was coming up, and we were having a big family reunion, and I didn't want to be the center of attention. So I didn't tell anybody. And the next week when I made an appointment with the doctor, the minute he examined me, he said, you need to see a surgeon. And I knew my suspicions were correct. And right at that moment, I knew definitely that I had cancer. And so for, from that perspective on, uh, I, I guess I knew too much. Uh, that was a problem for me because I knew what was coming down the road. I knew about the surgeries. I actually knew the chemotherapies I would be taking. I knew how long my radiation treatment would be. I, I, I knew all of that because I had helped so many other ladies down that, what we call the road of cancer. And that was a very, very hard uh, place to be, you know, to, to have that knowledge. At the same time, um, it was good in a way because I knew what was coming, but in many other ways, it, um, it was very difficult for me as a, as a patient, to become the patient, I guess. That was a very difficult moment. Uh, let's turn for our me, focus to... Um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Dick. Debbie first really found out that she had breast cancer. I was in Dallas, Texas, uh, doing a seminar, and she called me, and I knew she was going to see the doctor, and she called me from, uh, from the doctor's office, and she was just 
quivering voice and crying. And she said, Dick, she says, uh, my doctor wants me to go see an oncological surgeon. And so she said, it's bad. It's real bad. And so here I was in Dallas, Texas, and I said, honey, I said, I'll get on the first flight. So I got on the first flight, and I remember my first reaction was just crying. And so, uh, so you know, we prayed over the phone, and God, we didn't know exactly how this thing was going to turn out. But I remember flying home just perplexed. You never think, or I never thought, that uh, my wife would have breast cancer. And I guess the first thought that came to my mind was, am I going to lose her? Because I had so many friends that I administered with, some of my buddies uh, that I work with, uh, whose wives developed breast cancer, and one thing led to another, and the wife passed away. So my first impression was, oh, God, are we uh, not going to grow old together? And so I remember when uh, I entered the house that night, when I got home, it was about 1030 at night, uh, Debbie and I just uh, looked at each other and just hugged each other and just began to cry. And uh, it, it hurt. It was it was difficult, and it's been a difficult journey journey since then. What uh, wh- whose idea was it to write the book? Was it yours, Dick, or was it uh, yours, Debbie? It 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 was mine. Um, the reason um, I thought about it uh, because I know the different kinds of books that are out there, and there's not number one. There's not many oncology people that's an oncology counselor that has had cancer. And then number two is the fact that it's not written also from the perspective of the husband. Um, Husbands, a lot of times I've found uh, they disappear sometimes or they become, you know, they don't, they don't help the wife. Uh, They stay in denial. And I've seen that a lot through my counseling experiences. Um, especially those who uh, did not have a faith. You know, they were like, well, I'm out of here. You know, I was just here for good times, that kind of thing. And then when their wife developed cancer, they would go, see you later. Um, The elderly generation didn't seem to do that as much. They were there with their partner. They had made it there that long, so they didn't. But um, we... That's where the idea came from, that we would write a book together. And uh, that's, uh, you know, when we, Dick had written a lot on a journal page called The Caring Bridge, and he related that to his mountain climbing, because he's a mountain climber, uh, or big mountains like Mount Rainier and Mount Hood and all of those different kinds of things. And so he would write uh, the journal pages from that perspective and how I was uh, needing help to get over this mountain, and he would just write it. And so that's that's how it came about. That's how our our initial thought waves came about. Yeah, the, interesting, the, the, the title, uh, Don't Ever Look Down. Uh, as I was thinking about mountain climbing and that sort of thing, there's so many cor- uh, correlations between what Debbie was going through and just the difficulties, the struggles in trying to get up, uh, and I'm no uh, Peter Hillary. In fact, Peter Hillary, Sir Edmund Hillary's son, endorsed the book, which I was so excited because Sir Edmund Hillary's been a hero of mine for my entire life. So anyway, um, but thinking about the struggles, the, the, the pain, the equipment, uh, the, the support, the organization, all these things that you need to get up a mountain, that's where the... I was climbing with someone, and I would say, hey, listen... Keep going. Uh, don't stop. Now, don't look back. Don't look down. Just keep moving forward. Pick a goal. Keep walking. If you reach one goal, hey, that's great. Pick another goal and keep on going. Keep going up. Don't look down. Don't ever look down. And why that is so special for us and why this really became the title of the book is when Deb, uh, after her double mastectomy, she came home. And for a couple nights, she wasn't allowed to bathe. Um, she could only do like a little sponge bath. And then about the second or third night, she was allowed to take a shower. And, of course, she was wrapped very tightly with the bandage around her you know, her chest. And so she undid the bandage, and there were some tubes we had to hold on to and that sort of thing. And so neither one of us really looked too much at, uh, at the wound. I really, really didn't look at it at all. Kind of our eyes diverted from there. And I remember when she came out of the shower, 
she was in front of the mirror, and, and it was as if we both looked at the mirror at the same time, and we saw the, the horizontal red scar that um, was around her uh, chest. And so we didn't say a whole lot. It's, we tried to act like we didn't see it, and then Deb went and put on her pajamas, and she was on the other side of the room, and I was standing there on the other side, and Deb just started boo-hoo crying, and uh, she, she was just bent over crying, and I went over to her, and she, she walked over, and she just put, my, put her head in my chest, and she was looking down, and she was crying, and she said, Dickie, Dickie, please, please don't look at me. I'm so ugly. Please don't look at me. And... Gosh, to be in that situation, I, I was crying too. What do you say? What What can I do? And she kept lowering her head. She had her fist clenched under her chin, looking down. Please don't look at me. And so, it's as if God gave me some words to say. I I lifted her chin up. I said, Debbie. I said, Look at me. And she dropped her head again. I said, Debbie, look at me. I lifted her chin up. Look me in the eye. And she finally did. She looked at me in the eye. And we were both crying. And I said, Debbie. Uh, I didn't fall in love with your body. I fell in love with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Don't you ever, ever look down again. Mm. Um, I tell you, tell you, it uh, sounds like a wonderful book, um, Dick and, and Debbie. If uh, because of time, we we kind of need to uh, kind of leave it there as far as the <clears throat> the book goes. But if someone would like to obtain a copy of this book, don't ever look down. Surviving Cancer mm-hmm. Together. How does one go about uh, getting a copy of this book? Uh, they can go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com and, and do a search, and you can get it there. Or you can, they can visit our website, www.DontEverLookDown.com, and there's links to uh, ordering the book there. Uh, we have about uh, two minutes or so, uh, Dick and Debbie, if uh, a couple's listening to this program and maybe are just at the beginning stages of this uh, similar type situation to you, what is the uh, one piece of advice you can give them? Uh, From my perspective is uh, try to be honest with those that are around you. Uh, Tell them how you feel. Uh, Let them help you and receive that help, because I think God sends you special people in your life during that time and that you should really allow them to help you as they come to minister to you and to not be ashamed and not be uh, scared of your illness. And um, that, that, that would be one of the biggest things, I would say, is to allow people to minister to you. And as far as uh, any husbands uh, out there listening, uh, as Debbie knows and has mentioned, many, many husbands bail out on their wives, and I, I can't imagine anyone doing that. We've had some folks, as you know, in, uh, in politics that have done that. My advice to a husband out there who has a, a wife with breast cancer, you can't fix it. Uh, you can't sometimes say the right words. Uh, by and large, most of the time, all you can do is be there and hold her and hug her and let her cry. It's okay for you to cry. Just be with her. Because in the end, we don't know what cancer is going to do in our lives, but one thing that we know, it's never, ever going to take the love we have away from each other. So, guys, if you're out there and your wife has breast cancer, love her. That's what's going to help her, and that's what's going to help you work through this. Did you uh, find yourself leaning on the uh, Scripture a lot during that period, God will never leave you nor forsake you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, There were a lot of times we would read Scripture together, and that would be a great comfort to us. And, you know, we just would pick up our favorite verses, and that, that, that was a great comfort to both of us. You know, when you go through something like this, a major crisis, it doesn't have to be cancer. It could be any type of major crisis. I really, even as a minister, sometimes it's hard to see your wife go through that. Sometimes you ask the same questions, God, why her, why me, that sort of thing. But when all the dust settles, when all the questions have been asked, and sometimes there's no easy answers, the only place you can go to is the feet of Christ, the feet of God. And I found out that that is a place that's safe, and that's the place that's going to give you strength. And if you're going to make it through that, that's the only person you can get it from. And I tell you, we hold on to the hem of his garment 
because we know that is the source of strength, that's the sort of source of hope, and that's what's going to get us through this. Our guest tonight on Second Chances has been Dick and Debbie Church. And uh, one more time, uh, Dick, the website that uh, you can go to to find out more about the book and where you can get the book at one more time. Okay, www.don'teverlookdown.com, and there's links to ordering the books there, or they can go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com and do a search for Don't Ever Look Down, and it'll take them to the place they can order it. We'd like to thank you both for being with us tonight here on Second Chances. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Greg. We enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And God bless both of you. Dick and Debbie Church, our guest tonight, here on Second Chances at Lyft FM 98.5. And 97.9 on your FM radio dial.